Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel, I'm Rob and today we'll be jumping into some Pro Revenge. Our first story today comes to us from Board BSEE, Project Skunk, An Engineer's Tale. Let's jump right in. Decades ago I worked the worst crap job of my life as a software engineer, writing code for an OBD2 car code scanner at a completely dysfunctional business I'm not going to name, but I'll drop a hint and say all their products are orange. It was right after 9-11, I was laid off, and jobs were nearly impossible to find. But I managed to land one there, and out of desperation, I took the job. And there, I met probably the best friend I ever made at work. We'll call him Agent S. Agent S was a coder's coder, a real laid-back guy, and an all-around good egg. Imagine if the dude could code, you'd pretty much have Agent S. We had many wonderful overlong lunches working there, and I needed the calm he taught me, because that place was nuts. All the departments poisonously hated each other, the head of engineering was as paranoid as a Russian czar, rampant abuse, theft, the works. A total madhouse. But eventually, everyone has their limit, and Agent S had put in his two weeks notice. Just to let you know how nice he was, he was the only person that quit that wasn't escorted to his car immediately by an armed guard, which was standard procedure. He was permitted to put in his last two weeks. So imagine my surprise when Agent S said, I want some payback before I go. Maybe a few days earlier, the paranoid czar of engineering gave us this odd missive. When you leave your desk for any reason, you are to take your papers on your desk and lock them in your desk. You are to lock your computer. You are to put a password in your BIOS and shut down your machine when you leave for the night. You are to erase your marker boards leave no scrap of paper out, or any hint of what you're working on. And no explanation why, which was standard for him, just do it. Of course, we all wanted to know why, so our man in the field, I'll call him Bond, went about finding out. Bond was social and likable and had friends in every department in the increasingly balkanized organizational structure. I'll ask around and don't tell anybody. He found out Engineering Czar got word somehow that people in the sales department were working late and waiting for the engineering to leave. Once we left, they were going through our desks and computers looking for clues as to what we were working on. They would then copy this stuff down, claim it as a project I'm heading up, and present the material to their superiors so they could look valuable and get raises and all that fun sales stuff. Yes, I know. Sales is supposed to query their customers for features they'd like, then make proposals to engineering. I did say this place is dysfunctional, right? Engineers drove the product design since sales couldn't be bothered, and why should they when they could just steal it instead, right? So Agent S had had enough. We made Project Skunk. All projects in this place were named after an animal. We decided to leave a hint in the name that all was not as it should be and we dreamed up the most amazing OBD2 scanner in the world. Here are some of the specs. Since everyone knows 32-bit processors are more expensive than 8-bit processors, we would save money by using a 2-bit processor. The EEPROMs that held the automotive database were expensive as well. So, to save space, we would use a zip to compress the database 12 times and store it on a single 4K EEPROM. Predictive Analysis if you entered in the last few codes your car threw, it would extrapolate and tell you the next part on your car that was going to break. I thought of this one, I'm especially proud of it. And so on. We spent a happy afternoon drawing up box diagrams with flux capacitors and n-dimensional grommets and yo-yo dyne compensators, lots of specs and analyses, and other assorted bits of utter nonsense. We scattered them all over Agent S's desk, then went home. The very next day, our man in the field, Bond, gives us the news. Project Skunk is a hit. The entire building is buzzing over it. Salespeople are tripping over each other taking credit. It took about a week before the stolen goods were finally passed upstream to the six-figure guys before someone with half a clue noticed that everything in the project was absolutely effing impossible. Agent S had left by then, but I tracked him down and we had lunch, and I told him the results of the ill harvest he had left behind. Sales had been seriously embarrassed in front of their superiors, and the ones over them as well. I don't know if anything came of it, it was an old boys network there, and I'm sure they covered for each other somehow, but they were embarrassed and they were hurt. How do I know? 
every day from that day on, anytime a person from sales passed me in a hallway or something, they would physically turn their face from me to shun me. It was hilarious, like somehow I'm the a-hole for making fake stuff for them to steal. They went under not too long after that. The building is now a medical company supplying COVID masks. Does that sales team remind anybody else of the seagulls from Finding Nemo? Mine, 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 mine. Mind you, they weren't really like seagulls, they were more like vultures. Do me a quick favor, have a look down below the video. If that subscribe button's still red, it means you're not actually subscribed to the KCC channel. Please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories. Our second story today comes to us from Space is Pretty Big. For every action, let's jump right in. I once knew a young lad named Trevor, a young man who I regret not knowing better. Trevor, which is very much not his real name, was a more realistic version of what would happen to a goodwill hunting type personality if he was raised in the rural Midwest. For those who don't know, the culture of Midwestern USA is not defined by football, wheat fields, or people chanting USA. It's defined by boredom and all the crazy stuff people do with that boredom. See, the thing about Trevor was that he is insanely smart, though very much on the spectrum and loved to develop skills that were honestly useless in 90% of the real world. Let's be real, as much as they make for an awesome YouTube video or TikToks, outside of burglars and secret agents, the ability to pick a lock in 6 seconds flat, parkour up walls, or know how to determine a security camera's eye line are not really skills that have much value in most 9 to 5 settings. But Trevor had those skills. He had learned them from the early days of YouTube, from a 4chan still owned by Moot, from something awful, and God knows what other sites existed at that time that a pleb like myself never heard of. He was also a Midwesterner, which meant he had the time, space, and boredom needed to get good at them. Now the thing about Trevor is that he went to a school that seemed to still be stuck between the satanic panic of the late 80s and the drug wars of the 90s. They didn't just have all those silly rules on the books, such as no gangs of five or more can congregate, they actually enforced them. This led to poor Trevor, an avid hoodie fan and odd loner who never could quite get a handle on social things, to be an easy target for the administration. Trevor, being a child of the internet, really did try to do things the right way when it came to defying the absurd or unrealistic demands from the administration. When there was an unfair rule regarding shorts, he tried to wear a kilt, but not having the charisma needed to rally other students, he just made a target of himself, and the school just added another draconian rule to the books. Now, I'll never know where Trevor got his idea for revenge on the school, though I would not be shocked if it was from a very particular episode of Malcolm in the Middle, but apparently, after enough failed attempts to stand up to the administration, only to end up with just another draconian rule on the book, something clicked for Trevor. See, as mentioned, this administration was stuck in the past. Somehow, back in the day, a bunch of rural idiots got it in their heads that all their pasty white preteens were all just one NWA album away from being hardened gangbangers, one Anne Rice novel out from sacrificing their school chums to the devil, one puff of weed away from becoming crack addicts, and one slow dance away from becoming STD-riddled prostitutes selling themselves on a street corner. So Trevor, with no heroes to turn to, decided to become the villain, and thus began Trevor's long campaign to make the school as unbearable for everyone else as it was for him. He began small, little things scattered around the school, rolled paper with odd smelling content scattered behind the gym, a condom wrapper underneath a sink, a bit of graffiti of some ominous looking symbol on the corner of a utility shed, he mostly also did these things at night, which if anyone has ever lived out in the boonies knows, nighttime can get darker than if someone just blindfolded you. His main reason for this was to avoid getting caught with any of his little props during the day, now that the school had suddenly implemented a bag search policy. With each little prop he left behind, so did the administration tighten their grip around the student body. Graffiti, I really use the term lightly, it was mostly just swears, written on walls and bathrooms and marker and pencils? Sorry, no more outside writing implements. You had to take an assigned number two pencil from the newly implemented communal class supplies and return it at the end of class. Lacy panties covered in stains found in a locker room, wrapped around a used condom, no use of gym lockers or showers without a teacher present, which, for various reasons, led to a large number of sweaty teens, as most teachers, understandably, 
weren't volunteering their time to chaperone underage children showering, and the gym teacher could not exist in multiple points in space at the same time. Computer room, laptop, screensavers turned to anime adult material. That one was a twofer, getting both an entirely unmanageable permission system put into place, limiting computer access outside of class, as well as a general ban on anime, which naturally was very inconsistently enforced. Red color shoes with a black star and sharpie on them, red accessories now banned, such as bandanas, shoes, scarves, etc. I think Trevor was more going for a red scare angle on this one, but turned into a gangland thing instead. This went on for quite some time, and so people's resentment built slowly but surely. I'd like to say that the stick that broke the camel's back was one of the many, many new dress code restrictions that were unfairly put against the girls, which if the administration had gone on would probably end up looking like nuns, but this is the Midwest after all. The real camel break was the banning of school phones from property. See, they were already banned from classrooms, but most people put them in their locker. What pushed the administration to ban them outright was the discovery of discarded burner phones. In reality, Trevor had managed to get his hands on a bunch of very obsolete flip phones, none of them the same year or even brand, but all the right type of shabby to look like something from a cartel movie. He programmed some ominously vague looking contacts into the phones, specifically one of them being the meat packer and all of them leading to dead numbers. He then made sure to throw them away in optimally incriminating looking spots. If anything, the fact that all the phones were incapable of making outgoing calls anymore almost seemed to add to the paranoia factor. On its own, maybe even this rule would have been tolerated. This was the place where good old-fashioned values still ran true, and where people believed that kids should be spending less time with their nose in a screen, and more time experiencing the grand virtues of the real world. You know, all those empty fields, an economically downturned Main Street which was really just a strip mall, and abandoned garbage dumps. The thing is, the school had a very strict trespassing policy, one that actually predated Trevor's little campaign. There were exemptions, but not every student was on the swim team, so most kids had to kindly get their butt off property in an orderly manner. Here's the thing though, this was not the 80s, this was not the 90s. Parents had no interest in having to come on time to pick up their kids every day. They liked being able to text last minute and tell their kids to walk down the road and take the bus, or go home with a friend. This was one of those weirdly sprawling rural cultures, so school buses wouldn't and couldn't cover every house. Yes, I know they're legally obligated, but let's not kid ourselves, small towns are their own sort of crazy. And the idea that every parent in the student body had to now be punctual just wasn't all that feasible. Some families had both parents still working, a lot of parents were also salaried and could be asked or strong-armed into staying later. Hell, some parents just worked because they didn't want to go home. This started a chain of events that led to people asking the question, how come things have gotten so bad under this administration? See, the irony of all these draconian rules is that it made it seem like the school was in the midst of an epidemic. This school had been fine for years, but clearly something had changed, and the current administration couldn't handle it. It wasn't an overnight process by any means, but within a decent stretch of time, most of the higher-ups in the administration were systematically replaced. Then, wouldn't you just know it, all these big problems they were having seemed to suddenly clear up. No more condom wrappers, no more graffiti, still plenty of pot smoking, and no more gang paraphernalia. The new administration was much more reasonable. That is to say, they stopped reporting and enforcing issues that might make them look bad, and instead looked the other way whenever they could. Even anime eventually made a comeback. Thus, life went back to normal. As for Trevor, I'd like to say his story ended with him becoming a captain of industry or paraded on people's shoulders through town square, but unfortunately he was, in the end, an awkward kid on the spectrum, living in the Midwest. Without too much detail, life has not been kind to Trevor, and he still finds himself struggling to hold down jobs for very long. To give you a sense of Trevor's home life, during a heated argument, Trevor's mom once shot his father in the rear with a pew pew. It wasn't point blank, and his father had already booked it down the road when he saw the pew pew. She liked to brag that she managed to still tag his cheek at 100 yards while drunk off her butt. Ironically, that wasn't the reason they got divorced. Still, Trevor lives on. Wait a minute, what is this? A school story that's not about group projects? Whoa, weird. 
So comment down below, does anybody else think this story was actually written by Trevor and OP just tried to make it look like it was from a third party perspective? It's almost like they have too many details for that character. Hmm. Check out both OPs at the links in the description down below. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day. Bye bye.